to drop. It's an instant thing that you'll just know. If they flick it, money drops. Okay? So just know that hand has to stay on the side of the ball. If you want a less dramatic thing, you can just have them put their pointer finger and this thumb and just squeeze it. And they have to shoot it right there. What will happen is they're going to try to use kind of this right here and push it because they're so naturally you know, used to pushing that ball with their thumb. So that's solution number two if they use their thumb. Solution number three, if they do not get elbow above their eyebrow, you're literally going to have them stand right here with their arm up almost all the way, and you're going to have them snap up and shoot it. So just like that, you're going to have your arm up, yep, and snap up and shoot it. Good. And this is just going to work on that click, like clicking and making it fully extend every single time. That's the only way that they're going to be able to get the ball up. Boom, you just click. And again, notice every single time we're almost all the way at the top, so we have to really extend and get that elbow up. That takes care of that. If you've got a guy that has bad touch, big guys, a lot of times have bad touch, we're going to do a drill called bank shooting. I'll take your spot real quick. You're going to stand right here with your feet on the charge circle, your heels on the charge circle. You're going to try to shoot bank swishes. You have to bank the ball above the square and then ask to swish in the net. Bad shooters will go like this. Boom. And then they'll start going here. And they'll hit the rear real hard. What they're going to have to do is soft, high and soft, and then switch it in like that. So I want you to try that out. It's going to work on high and soft. Notice hit the rear right there. Right, you're good. Perfect. And that's a high and soft touch right there. Good. Okay? That's our next solution. If they don't have touch. They don't have touch. If they don't snap the ball with their pointer finger, so if they have one of these, which happens a lot, where they get their wrist going one way. You're going to do a three-finger drill. If Wade Thompson does this drill, he can do this all the way out to NBA three-pointers. You have these three fingers, these two fingers tucked. You put your ball right where you want it, which obviously find an air hole, you put these two fingers in, and you do this. When you shoot this ball, look how much backspin comes on. And it's perfect backspin because these are the two fingers that are supposed to come off. So you're going to have these two fingers up, this finger back, and when you shoot it here, you're going to actually have to snap through, and it'll be perfect backspin at the rim. Perfect. You see that backspin is flying right now. Good. Perfect. That's great. Get it set. Get it set. Get that wrist back. Nice. Perfect backspin right there. One more time. Set on the make. Good. So that takes care of the backspin. If you're having a flick to one side, get them used to getting the ball coming off the perfect fingers every single time. Okay? The last thing, and this is the last thing that I really notice that people do a lot of times, is they do it perfect. So now we've got pretty much everything, every problem that I normally see right there, except for the clean pickup. Most people don't know how to get the ball to their pocket. And so I do a drill called lift shooting, or we got pocket lift shooting, where basically my hand's up and I just snap the ball in my pocket and go up. So it's not a snap and then shoot, it's one rhythm from here, and I go up. Notice how clean that is. Boom. We're off the dribble. Boom. Boom. Or if I'm off the footwork. Boom. Off the footwork. Boom. You notice how clean the ball just comes in my pockets because I do it every single day. But if you guys watch Steph Curry, he gets a shot off an average of 0.4 seconds off the dribble. And then he shoots over 40% from NBA 3 off the dribble. That is because he works on this every single day. It's ball and foot. If you're doing the drill, stay sherry. Just keep these foot here, feet here. Snap up, get your hand under the ball. Every single time you shoot. If you're doing it off the dribble the first time, same exact thing. Then you have your right hand. Notice the ball always comes to my shooting hand. Your shooting hand should never, your shooting hand thumb should never cross your nose. Because as soon as you pick the ball here, now you've got to slide the ball and it causes that side spin and it causes rim outs. So if I'm dribbling left, it snaps. If I'm dribbling right, hand comes to it. My shooting hand always stays on. And then you can start doing drills where ball and heel hit at the same time. And you just get it up there or notice that every single time it is quick, smooth to the pocket. Those are the drills that I would use to correct people's shots. Questions on shots before we go on to the next topic. Any questions on shots? I know we're going to have a question and answer session later, but this is 
Women, uh, uh, women mostly shoot different. Is there any tactic to that? For women? Yeah. yeah, so my sister played college basketball, so I worked with her. Yeah. So women, and you guys are laughing, this is how women shoot. Right there most of the time, right? Yeah. And so the big thing that I would say off of them is keeping their shoulders over their knees. So even if they do hop, so I did study on a hop versus one, two, and a lot of people wonder that. They're pretty much the same. Most players in the NBA use both for different scenarios. The hop gets you more distance, one, two gets you more kind of control when you're on balance and have more time. Hop is probably quicker, one, two is a little bit slower, unless the ball hits the same time as the foot. So obviously preferred would be ball and foot. So really it's only a one count with a one, with two breaks, but it was 44% and 43%, or 42%, so it didn't matter. Okay, so basically it's the same. But for girls, keep their shoulders over their knees when they hop. A lot of times they go back here, and then it's a push. Instead of if their shoulders are over their knees, then it's a shot. The second thing is if they're not strong enough, they have the ball back a little bit, just make sure they keep everything on a straight line. So even if the ball's back here lower, it's totally fine to push and follow the exact same steps. Most girls mess up because their shoulders go back and their arm goes forward, instead of their shoulders stay forward and their arm goes up. The other thing is, it's the exact same teaching point as far as, even if the arm's back, straight line through the ball, elbow, the line, drop, point your finger at the rim. The one drill that helped my sister a lot is when she was shooting, she had trouble when she got back here, she wanted to crank and her hips would go over here. So what I had her do was do a drop drill, where she would just literally, it would be like this, and you would drop the ball with two hands. So it'd be like this, and you would go down with it. So like, drop, and then she'd have to shoot. So then her hips had to be here, and then she had to get her hand under the ball. So it's just, hand under the ball. Because now, look at this. Weight is equally distributed on both. Most girls crank back here, and now they lose their balance because now everything's loaded on their opposite hip. That's why they have a lot of knee problems, actually. Okay, thank you. No problem. Let's start teaching kids how to shoot like this. Because when they're seven years old. No question, yeah. When, if I was teaching, like if I had to bring up somebody and say this is a perfect thing, and so like, until there was eight, nine, I would just have fun with them, right? And just let them enjoy the game and teach them basic, just pass with both hands, drill with both hands, and finish with both hands. If they got those things down as a you know eight year old, they're really, really good in my opinion. They're really set themselves up for the future. When they get to the ten to twelve range, is when I would start just making sure they're in a straight line. Doesn't matter if their arms back, just make sure everything flows with a straight line. And then when they get stronger and old enough, then I would raise their elbow to the elbow parallel to the ground. But until they can shoot with their elbow parallel to the ground, so basically I always say your range is dictated by how far you can shoot a one-handed shot with a jump. Because if I start doing this and cranking back, I can't shoot from this distance. So if they can shoot here and just go up and shoot it, then they can shoot. If they go here, maybe it's right here, and I'm going, okay, I'm shooting right there. Oh, okay, that's probably my range. But if I go back here and I start firing up, that's probably not my range. So I just say, whatever you can shoot with your elbow starting parallel, Using your legs, that's your range. And so most seven-year-olds can't even shoot from form shooting like that, which means they're not ready to teach shooting yet. If I was a, if I was a coach that was teaching seven-year-olds, all I would teach when shooting, hold my follow through and stick my hand. Just get the ball up and then land square, because they can land square. And if they do that, they eliminate that bad push motion that most do when they end up turning. Great question. Other questions on shooting before you move on? Questions? Uh, you said if you, if you turn in the air, then you, you know, the percentage will drop. But what if you start out turn and then you land in the same angle? What, what's the percentage? Yeah, the same exact thing. So I said you can start like 11 o'clock and land at 11 o'clock. That's totally fine. So pre turn is fine, there's no jump in the air turn. So if you start at 11 o'clock and land at 11 o'clock, you're okay. Now I will tell you this Mario Chalmers, I was laughing about this at lunch. Everybody laughs, all the advanced scouts in the NBA laugh, because Mario Chalmers always gets shut down in the playoffs because he turns so much, and they just force him right, and then he's useless. Because when he goes here, he has to literally turn and hit his square, and they just, all season long, they let him do whatever he wants, and in the playoffs, they just jam him and force him right, and it takes longer. So just know, the more square you are, the easier it is to go both ways. The more you turn, the harder it is when you go to your strong. Most, most shooters, honestly, are about 11 o'clock. Very few players, unless they're in the deep corner or top of the key, are very perfectly 12 o'clock. Most players are a little bit turned just so they get their elbow more comfortable. 
And most of I always say the players have to be comfortable and confident if they're going to be consistent. So that's a great question. Other questions on shooting. I know this is a big topic. That's why I'm going to be taking mid-session questions on shooting. Yes. Yes, he's asking about feet. Again, if you're forward, that's kind of the old school teaching. Now people say turn a little bit. Yeah, so basically it's whatever's comfortable. But notice the more you turn, the more you're forward, then the less your hips can be equally distributed. So if I'm here and my feet are parallel to each other and kind of even, even if I turn at 11 o'clock, it basically does the same thing that old school 12 o'clock with the foot in front does. Basically, they wanted to line that shoulder up a little bit more. So that 11 o'clock takes care of that. But if you're here with one foot floor, you can't distribute the weight equally, so your hips aren't even, which is a problem. So most people like parallel, because then I can go down. And I always say, if you want to convince somebody that you're right and they're wrong, so like, if you say this, I'll just do this. I'd say, okay, hey. You they say, my coach used to teach me this. I said, okay, great. I want you to jump as high as you can, you ready? And so it's okay. And I say, stop. Look at your feet. No one jumps like this when they're as high as they can because they can't distribute the weight equally. They, they can hear. And so I'll, obviously that's why we do it. Yeah. No question. Yeah, no, and, and that's and that's a great point. And my balance this thing is if you look at like a boxer, boxers are like this, right? They're all very unbalanced. But my thing is, again, it goes to right one left. If you go right, can you get this foot? Whereas if you're going left, now I have to stop short. So it's just, again, it's more about balance throughout your shot than balance before your shot, if that makes sense. So, yeah, and again, it's based on studies. My thing is, I'm a very, uh, I'm one of those guys that learns more by proof. Like, I'm one of those guys that I have to have proof to kind of see what's right and what's wrong. I've never, I've changed theories. I used to be, have to be 12 o'clock. And then I watched and I said, oh, that, oh that's you. Coffee at 11 o'clock, well, that's probably the best. And so I did the study, and most shooters were, it didn't really matter, 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock, but I said, either or, that was fine. So, um, but one foot in front of the other, the main people that do that are the people that are big guys because coaches try to break down their shots, and the results just aren't, aren't as good. So I just, based on results, I always say that. Any other questions on shooting? Yes. Yeah, go with the shot, you want everything going upward, you want all your emotions. So when I'm here, my shot, I want this thing to finish parallel right there. Because if you go like this, then naturally what your body's gonna do is turn, your shoulders are gonna turn. So right here, my shoulders stay even. Right there, my shoulders turn. So you don't want any movement going down, otherwise you're gonna turn your shoulders, which also is gonna make you push your shot to the side instead of straight through. Good question. Any other shooting? Yes. Free throw. Yeah, I, I always, when I teach guys, I always teach them basically either shooting pocket in line with the free throw. So basically, you're on a right hand shooter, my right foot on the nail, or my, my left hand shooter, left foot on the nail. But again, there's, on that one, I don't have results. So I, I think that some people find success with it even. I prefer all my guys just lined up so that everything's in a straight line. I just want my shooting right there. No question, turn. Yeah, and so on a free throw game, a free throw is a perfect scenario where you can line up and take your time, no one's guarding, no one's moving. So a lot of people have had success turning. Um, again, I think it's just my preference is having one shot consistent everything you do off the dribble, off the bounce, uh, off the catch, off the move off the free throw, instead of having two shots, because really you have to practice here and here. If you're shooting, catching shoots here, there's no reason to practice a free throw where it's a different shot. So my thing is I'd rather be really, really good at one thing than have to work on two things, if that makes sense. But again, I do see a reason in guards that are like this, um, but and Kobe Bryant did it. There's been some shooters that have done it. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't work, but I just, I would rather have one shot. Best shot, and this is this is an easy answer for me. If you look at the front of the rim right here, 
That means you're looking here. If you look at the front of the room over here, you're looking at a totally different spot. If you look at the back of the room over here, you're looking at right there. Whereas if you look at the back of the room here, you're looking at there. Only spot that doesn't change is right there. And obviously, if you want to hit your target, where do you want to hit? The net. So my thing is, I always just literally say, people always, the counter argument is there's nothing physically you can look at. I just want you to look right over the rim. My, my terminology is always drop it over the front of the rim so that if we hit our target, we actually make it. I don't like when people say, hit the front of the rim, well, then you miss it. I don't want to hit the back of the rim, I don't want to hit the front of the rim, I want to drop it over the front of the rim so that's a switch. So that's my thinking point is never, obviously if everything's straight, when everything is left to right, and then if I say drop it over the front of the rim, we're never going to short. So the only way we can miss is long. So the, if I was looking, I would literally look at right over the front of the rim, if that makes sense. I know it's not a place you can lock in on as a target, but that's where we want to ultimately shoot the ball. Question. What's that? I'm not. Oh, when you're tired, how do you shoot? Yeah, I mean, when you're tired, you should shoot the exact same way. Is that what you're asking? Oh, you're saying when you're fresh, you should shoot like under, basically, when you're tired, you shoot over? No, I, I would still I agree. My thing is, again, as a good player, I'm fatigued enough. Uh, I should be able to perform when I'm fatigued, and I want everything to stay consistent. I don't want to start changing where I change my target. So for me, I'm just looking always over the front of the rim, and I'm just incorporating more hips and more legs in my shot when I'm tired because I need more power. I don't want to change my target. Really. Does that make sense? My thing is just consistency all around the board. I want to shoot. I'm at 11 o'clock off the dribble, and I'm at 11 o'clock off the catch, going right, going left, going everywhere. Last question, we'll move on, and then I'll answer any questions later. Shot the corner off, penetrate the Yeah. Are you deciding anything on the catch? Like, down the stack, okay, but one is one to catch. So, shot ready, yeah. So, basically, it depends on where you are. Um, numbers show that you're better off your permanent pivot foot. So, left, right. If I'm a right hand shooter, right left, if I'm a left hand shooter, or a hop. Um, but very rarely, if you're off the catch and you're spot up, will you ever go with strong foot, weak foot. That's the only thing in the, in the NBA. Obviously, the corner, you only have you know, two and a half feet to work with. So a lot of times, we do a, a side step, one, two, so you get some rhythm into it. It's very hard to catch and shoot and generate that power for your hips. Um, so the biggest thing is just getting rhythm and basically flow. I don't mind a mini dip, like getting that little ball there, but I always tell the ball should never go below your belly button. Obviously, some players, you see, just if they, it's just natural, it's very hard, but to quicken up a shot, I, I encourage a mini dip to get rhythm, but never let it drop so that you still get that quickness. But as far as feet go, always kind of get some kind of either a hop, because basically what I always say is drop your hips. So either a one-two and drop your hips, or a hop and drop your hips. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast forward and we can come back to questions and I'm going to go over ball screen reads to finish this off. And then we'll obviously, I know I'm supposed to have 15 minutes of questions there, I'm going to carry over a little bit longer for this. So if I could, um, can I get number 5, can you come up here real quick? And then number 14, can you come up here? And then let me get number, uh, who hasn't come up here in a while? Come up, number 9. Alright, so number 5, you're, you're going to be right here, screen. First off, let me talk about the screen. You've got the ball, you're guarding the ball, okay? You're guarding me. You can screw back a little bit. First thing I want to teach you guys is the screen. And there's a couple of things about a screener that are very important, and I'm going to change one thing that you guys might hate me for, but I'm going to prove to you why it's more effective. First thing is, some people say sprint the screen. I'm going to change it a little bit and say separate the screen. The reason is, if I'm a slow fat guy, say you're back a little bit, I'm a slow fat guy. This guy's a quick guy. If I sprint up, he's going to stay attached to me the whole time. That doesn't do anything for us. Sprinting did nothing. We didn't create any advantage. If I'm a slow back guy, then what I need to do is I need to walk up. Walk, walk, walk. Boop. My last three steps are quick. Because now what I did is I created separation. 
So our number one key when screening is arrive without your defender. Arrive without your defender. Create separation from your defender. That's number one important thing. Number two important, most important thing when you're set a screen is put your butt where you want them to attack. So back to the point of attack, sometimes if you want to use a, like a rhyme for your little kids, but I say just put your butt to where you want them to attack. If you want them to go to the rim, put your butt to the rim. Now some people are going to go, okay, Drew, you're supposed to set chest to the sideline. You're not. If you watch the NBA game, it's because they study angles, and this is why. So set the screen right here, my man. Put your butt to the rim. Now, most people don't set screens like this, but most people don't don't really study the game anymore, read books and listen to clinics. If I'm right here, and say you're guarding me, and I can run you into the screen, boom, perfect. So I use the screen, now I'm attacking, look where I'm at, downhill. If he cuts me off, so cut me off, so say you're up here, cut me off. Now, when I flip the screen, I can still run him into the screen. I can use the screen two ways now. Turn this way, but, uh, chest and side. Uh, just in a second, get to back up a little bit. Now, traditional, get them below the screen, so see here. So yeah, it's great if you go this way, but look, now where am I attacking? Over there. And if he beats me in the screen, boom, if I cross over, he's not in place to screen because his chest is to the side. It requires him to flip the screen, which obviously is like a movie screen. So what we want to do is, but to where we want him to go. So that means up to the rim usually, and then on like a horn screen, so say you have two screeners, most of the time you want them to get you basically the elbow. So you put your butt to the elbow, okay? So put your butt to the rim and you're just gonna hold it right there. Yep, push and get low and wide and actually set the screen, okay? So that's the first key. Second key, say you're guarding here real quick, and say you're sagging back. We're gonna go over all the reads, okay? And you're guarding me. First thing I want to do is I want to create some kind of separation. I want to get him in a trail position. So if I can reject, I always reject because the coverage thinks I'm going to use a screen. So number one option is reject. I'm going to give you nine options real quick. So number one, if you're, if you're taking away, dang, I just reject. I get to this space, so there's a ton of space down here. We're good to go. Number two is the only way I'm not going to reject is if he is overplaying me and actually forcing me to the screen. You can be a little more honest. Yeah, right there. So if he's taking away my reject, my number two option, I'm going to use a hip swivel, which means you just basically get your hips square to the rim, and then I sprint off. I beat him to my screener, and now what I've got is a couple options. Number one is to say that guy's sagging back a little bit, I've got a pocket jump shot. That's option number two. So number one is reject, option number two is pocket jump shot. Option number three is a tight wrap. Which means, say I can't get this jump shot because he's a little bit up right there. I'm going to wrap it to space and then shoot here. Or if he comes up and the roller rolls, obviously I just have that little pass right there to him. So option number three is a tight wrap. Option number four, set that screen real quick, is I come off and I fake the tight wrap by doing it inside out. So now he thinks I'm going there, in and out, and I go there. That's option number four. Option number five is I sneak it to the rim. If you watch like Drodzy play, if you watch a lot of the good point guards, they come off the screen, they wrap it, and they beat them downhill to the rim and shoot that little half hook that we worked on earlier. That's option number five. It's a snake. Option number six, this guy is hedging right here, but he's staying attached to the screener, which means he's basically touching the screener. So option number six is coming off right here. I'm gonna do a quick evade, which means a quick evade. I'm gonna quickly evade around the defender. Ball hits the same time as my inside foot, we jab right at the, the hedge guy. That freezes the defense. Step two, lunge and protect the ball. Step three, get by him. So basically I'm making a tight triangle around the hedge guy and I'm using the hedge guy as a second screener. So if I'm here, I start to attack, I go down, up, down, and I'm right behind. My goal is to get downhill. Downhill again means to the rim, to the baseline. So I need to get around them. Most people just do this. They see the hedge, they flow back, this guy squares up, we didn't accomplish anything. 
We want to get right around that hedge guy and attack. So if I'm here, I'm coming up, down, uphill, downhill, and go. The next one, coaches get mad. Coach says, we're going to blitz. We're going to really like trap him. So he hedges out. So start right there. You're going to wait. You're setting screen. Just set the screen. Yep. I start to come. He starts to clean. Right through, split, and finish. And I'm ready to split. And I'm ready to split. Number nine is he gets smart. He hedges, but he doesn't really leave room to split. And this is our final ball screen read that you need for high school level. And this is called a top pop. I'm going to pop to the top of his head. So he's there. I pop, square up, right to the top. So say he's hedging like this, his arm out here, like where you were, like that way. I need to pop here, keep the ball protected. Notice my hips are square. My defender is going to naturally run here. And as you start to recover your guy, I'm going to run right off of you. So look at number nine right here, top hop. I just open up my hips to the rim. I attack this guy. And I get around him. Those are the nine ball screen reads that you need as a ball handler. If you've got those nine, you're a really good player. I'm gonna answer one question real quick before anybody asks it. This is what people always say. Well, the reason I like my guy to drill